Well, we can be thankful for some things in life, one of which is that the debates are over. <laughs> we don't have to, to worry about those this week. It's not just, of course, that you can skip the, watching the debates, but you tune into any news or commentary show thereafter, and all you hear about is who won the debate, and was this a zinger, and was he right about this, and by golly, my man won. The other guy looked so inept, and my man was in command of the facts, and oh, I mean, just on and on and on. And what's the point? What's the point of interviewing a Republican and a Democrat after the uh, debate is over because you know exactly what these people are going to say and they don't bring anything to the news broadcast that you wouldn't have known already and that is that the Republican representative thinks Bush was magnificent and the Democratic representative thinks that Kerry looked presidential and you know on and on and on but now that they're over and we look back at it do did you notice that neither candidate suggested any way whatsoever that he would reduce a federal program, eliminate a federal program, or in any way move in the direction of smaller government, even if it was just to be in one department that would be overshadowed by increases in another department. No, not even the slightest cut in any program that isn't working. Kerry didn't even criticize anything that the Bush administration was doing in terms of this shouldn't be done at all, but rather I could do it better. And, of course, no moderator in any of them, and no audience question was allowed that would say, where are you going to reduce government? Do you think government is too big or anything of that uh, kind of activity? Now, it might be easier for you to think that, of course, they don't ask questions like this because everybody wants more government. Everybody wants the government to do something, and everybody's in love with his own federal program. Therefore, why in the world would they get into that? That's just a way to lose votes. Obviously, every candidate has to propose new government programs to try to solve problems that people are concerned about. But, you know, I think we make a mistake in making some assumptions. For example, there was a poll a few years back that asked people, do you agree with the statement, quote, the federal government is much too large and has too much power, end of quote. People were asked, do you agree with the statement, the federal government is much too large and has too much power? Now, what percentage of the people polled would you think answered that question, yes, as opposed to those who answered it, no? The federal government is much too large and has too much power. What would you say, 20%? You know, polls indicate that people with libertarian beliefs constitute about 22% of the population, in second place behind conservatives and well ahead of liberals. So would you say that 22% would have said the federal government is much too large and has too much power? Or would you say it could even be more than that, like 30 or 40 or 50% even? You know what? 73% said, yes, the federal government is much too large and has too much power. All right, another question that was asked. Do you agree with the statement, big government is the biggest threat to the country in the future, as opposed to corporations being the biggest threat or something of that sort? 67% agreed with the statement, big government is the biggest threat to the country in the future. Now, that poll was taken before 9-11. I will grant you that. All right. What about government regulation of business? Does it do more harm or does it do more good? 63% said it does more harm than good. How many people trust the government in Washington to do what is right most of the time? What would you think? Uh, 50%, 70%, 80% trust the government in Washington to do what is right most of the time? Well, the result was only 22% trust the government in Washington to do what is right most of the time. Not all of the time, just most of the time. And what about third parties? Uh, most people don't recognize that there are ballot access laws and campaign finance laws that shut third parties out, shut them out legally from the system. We tend to think, or I don't, but maybe you do, tend to think the third parties just simply don't appeal to people, and that's why we have this two-party system. But a poll showed that 60% want a strong third party to provide a true alternative to what they're getting now. Now, stop and think about it. If 73% believe the federal government is much too large and has too much power, then obviously when they see that no Republican or Democrat is suggesting smaller government, why wouldn't 60% want a third party that could provide a true alternative? Now, if these polls are not recent. I grant you that. They're all about 10 years old. And I need to do some research to find what might have been done more recently, and especially 9-11 in this regard. But as you can imagine, very rarely, very rarely does a pollster ask people a question like, do you think government's too big or too small? But these polls were done by such companies as Luntz, Roper, the Times Mirror Center for the People in the Press, 
CBS News and the New York Times, and so forth. So these were not just little private polls that were commissioned by some rinky-dink outfit. You know, back in 94, I decided I was going to run for president, and for the two years that I was running in the 96 campaign, from 94 to 96, I went around the country, traveling here, there, and everywhere, making appearances. But in the process of traveling, I asked a question of bellmen, skycaps, uh, room, hotel room clerks, uh, cab drivers, and so on. I asked the question, do you think government is too big, too small, or just about the right size? And you'd be surprised at the answers that I got. Well, over and over and over again, just over and over and over again, people said, oh, government is way too big. Oh, yes, yes, yes. And then very often the person would go on about his favorite dislike about the government and his favorite example of the way the government was too big, too overbearing, too intrusive, too whatever. And it's very important, I think, not to prejudge people. When my wife Pamela and I were in Minneapolis, we were headed to the airport after some event, and the cab driver was a woman who was probably in her 30s, maybe 40, I'm not sure. And we were talking about living in Minneapolis and what it was like. I mean, it's cold country there, a lot of snow in the winter and so forth. And she was telling us how much she enjoyed living in Minneapolis. She'd only been there a few years. And she finally said, and one thing I really love about Minneapolis is that it's a good old-fashioned liberal town, and people are not afraid here to call themselves liberals. And I like that because I think that liberalism is the right path. So I'm thinking to myself, well, it's kind of a waste of time to ask this woman whether she thinks government is too big, too small, or about the right size. But I have to ask her, to be fair, to get her answer mixed in with all the other answers I've gotten where people have said that government was too big. So I said, uh, do you mind if I ask you a question? She said, no, go ahead. And I said, do you think government is too big, too small, or about the right size? And she said, oh, it's way too big. Oh, God, it's terrible. You should see what the taxes are here in this state. They're just outrageous. And she went on and on for just about the rest of the trip to the airport telling me how big and bad government was. This woman who had pretty much identified herself as a liberal. Now, I've said before on this show that I don't think you should uh, beat a dead horse, that if you've got somebody who is clearly in love with government, clearly not interested in what you have to say, leave that person alone and go find somebody who might be interested in what you say. Any good salesman is not going to waste his time on somebody who's clearly not a prospect. He's going to conserve his time and his energy and his, emo his emotional reserve uh, for people who really have a chance of buying. But... You don't know that somebody is not a prospect until you do something to find out. And so it's important that just because somebody says he's a liberal or he's a Bush supporter or whatever it is he might call himself or whatever it is he might say, you still don't know that he's not a prospect until you have qualified him in some way. And I'm going to tell you what I think is one good way of qualifying somebody, of finding out really whether or not he is a prospect. But first, let me continue with my little story about those two years when I was running around the country asking people whether they thought government was too big, too small, or about the right size. I would like to be able to tell you that every single person that I approached uh, with this question answered by saying, government is too big. But I'm afraid I can't. Because there was one person who didn't answer that way. This was a young woman, probably in her very early 20s, who was working as a clerk in a hotel gift shop. Uh, you know, the kind of place there where it's a combination drugstore and gift shop in a hotel where you go in to buy some toothpaste or something that you forgot to bring on your trip or maybe a gift for somebody that you're going to see in the city, whatever it may be. So anyway, there was nobody in the place except just her and me, and I think Pamela was with me at the time. So after the transaction was completed, I said, do you mind if I ask you a question? And she said, no. And I said, do you think government is too big, too small, or about the right size? And she thought about it and thought about it some more and thought about it still even more. And finally she said, well, I guess I'd have to say that government is too small. And I said, oh, really? That's interesting, because after all, this was the first person who had given me that answer. And I said, well, tell me, what is it you think government ought to do that it's not doing now? And she said, get all those people off of welfare. <laughs> so that was the one person in two years who said that government was too small, that I approached on a person-to-person -person basis. There was another way that this came up, and that was when I would give a speech before an audience like a Rotary Club or some other public gathering that could be made up of people of various different political views because they were not coming together for some political purpose, but rather for a service club or a social thing of some kind, whatever. In many, many gatherings like that, not all of them, but in many of the gatherings that I addressed, 
I asked that question at the outset. I said, would you please raise your hand if you think government is too small? And I would get maybe one or two hands would go up. Then do you think government's about the right size? And I'd get maybe two or three hands. Then is government too big? And I would get everybody else in the audience would raise his hand. And then I would say, is government way too big? And everybody would raise, almost everybody would raise his hand. And I promised you a few minutes back that I would give you an opening approach to people and a way of qualifying them to find out whether or not they really are prospects. And by now, you may have figured out what that opening approach is. It's a simple question. Do you think government is too big, too small, or about the right size? Now, there's an advantage to this beyond qualifying people. I think what you're going to find is that at a minimum, two-thirds to three-quarters of the people you ask this question of are going to say the government is too big. You may find a different set of answers. Maybe you're in a part of the country where people just feel they're terribly deprived of the government that they want. I doubt it, but anything's possible. I haven't interrogated all 200 million plus people in the country. But it not only will qualify people as being prospects, but it will also identify to the person himself how he feels. Because most people don't stop and think about it in those terms. And when you ask the question, you are really pushing the person to make a decision in his own mind of how he feels about government. And it only takes a few seconds before the average person stops and thinks, oh, it's way too big. My taxes are too high. And government doesn't seem to do anything right, and yet all we hear about are politicians proposing all these programs and so forth. And what a mess they've made in Iraq and so on. These are the kinds of thoughts that go through people's minds when you ask the right question. But those thoughts may never occur to people otherwise because there's nothing that they're going to see in a television news show that's going to force them to think that way. Other friends of theirs are not going to ask them the question that's going to call attention to, their, to themselves of how they feel about government. But the simple question on your part may very well open the door not only to you but to the person himself to realize how he feels about government. Then, when you talk about a specific issue, you can always come back to the fact that we have agreed that government is way too big, and the only way we're going to make government smaller is by getting rid of some of these ridiculous programs, rather than hanging on to them and saying, well, maybe they do a little bit of good here or there. No, we're going to have to get rid of these programs. It's the only way we're going to keep government or change government so that it no longer is too big. And if there's some new program that somebody thinks, well, we've already decided that government is too big, why would we want to make it even bigger? We know that government programs don't produce the results promised for them. We can just see a whole host of programs that have failed to live up to their promises. Why would we want to accept the politicians' promises that the next program is going to work. But it's important, I believe, to establish first that government is too big before you get into specific programs. If you start out by saying, what do you think about this new health care proposal or this new ID card or this, that, or whatever it may be, you might get any kind of an answer. And then you will be going uphill if the person is predisposed towards thinking that this might actually be a good program. But if you first establish that you think and the person thinks that government is too big, you've got a framework within which now you can operate, and you can operate much more easily, much more comfortably, and without the resistance that you would get if you hadn't established that first. And the best way to establish it is not by telling the person that government is too big, but asking him for his opinion. So... We can talk about that further. If you have any questions about it or criticisms of it or comments of it, just give me a call at 1-800-259-9231 or email me, question, at harrybrown.org. The number again, 1-800-259-9231. And one person who's dialed that number is Jonathan in Washington, D.C., the cradle of democracy. Jonathan, good evening. Hey, Harry. It's uh, good to talk to you again. You too. Um, I have to tell you, I am really glad that you brought up this topic on the next show about the public opinion on big government because, actually, this is one thing that I have long disagreed with you on about. Um, I remember reading your book, Why Government Doesn't Work, several years ago, and I, I think it's a, a great libertarian book uh, for anybody, libertarians or non-libertarians. But I remember reading that you say at one point the two major obstacles um, – at that point, it was for your campaign, but uh, I guess it's for the, the Libertarian Party um, right now, is to get the message out, the Libertarian message out, and number two, to deal with the waste of vote syndrome, uh, so that people feel that uh, voting Libertarian is uh, and, uh, something that can get results. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, recent, I remember reading that and thinking to myself, you know, it, it seems to imply that almost everybody already agrees with the idea. We just have to get, show them that we represent, that we're the representatives of these ideas, and deal with the waste of vote syndrome, and then we're good to go. And I, that... From my personal experience, I haven't talked to nearly as many people as you have, but uh, I, I don't see it that way. And recently I read a book um, called Living with Leviathan. Have you ever heard of that? 
Uh, it sounds familiar, but I can't place it. It, it was published it? in 1990 by a couple of political scientists, Linda and Stephen Bennett, and uh, they're, they are professors, or they were at that time, at the University of Kansas. Um, uh, which, you know, if, if they were professors at Harvard or, or Princeton, you might think that they might have a bias toward um, saying that big government is great. That's not to say they don't, just because they teach at the University of Kansas. But um, in the book, they, they analyze a, an enormous amount of data, and in a nutshell, and I'm, I'm simplifying it greatly here, obviously, but they say that, you know, Americans do, most Americans do think that government is too big, but they also want more spending and regulation in almost every area. Um, well, they, so want, they want it in particular areas that they think uh, either does some good nationally or does some good personally. In other words, my, my son's about to go to college, and I'd like to have him get a student loan, and I would love it if they would double the size of that grant or whatever it might be. Sure, sure. Um, but my point is that just because somebody says, yeah, government's too big, uh, does not mean that they, have, they know exactly what that means, or that if you say, well, okay, then you, you said government's too big, then of course we should not have uh, more education programs. Well, we can't cut education. No, education's important. We need more spending for that. Well, okay. let's, look, let's talk about that when we okay. come back. Was there something further you wanted to say before I get all exercised? <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate the opportunity. Um, I, just, I, I think I, I basically uh, got my point across, but the people, it may also be a function of the people that I talk to, that I interact with, well, you, um, you might consider moving to another city. <laughs> well, I, I live in several cities. I mean, I talk to a lot of people who are in their 20s and 30s, so around my age. And um, uh, they're, all, they're all in cities, obviously. They're not in, in rural areas of the country. And basically, it seems axiomatic to, to most of these people, not all of them, but most, that, you know, of course we need government involvement in these areas. And even if, and, uh, even if someone says, yes, government is reflexively, I don't like politicians or government's too big, saying, Okay, then that's why we need to get government out of healthcare. Get government out of healthcare? No. Well, how do you expect to make government smaller if you don't get it out of anywhere? Uh, and that's where the, the problem lies. Well, people first of all, you have you have to expect that people not too long out of school are dealing with a mental construction that reflects what they've been taught, which is that government saved us from the Great Depression and that government regulation keeps greedy business, businessmen from poisoning us and, mm -hmm. and uh, selling us unsafe cars and so forth, and that's to be understood. And secondly, the fact that most people think that government is too big does not mean that we don't have a job to do. Obviously, we do, uh, and I will get to that job and uh, the specifics of that job in a moment. But we also need to realize that the fact that people say that they like some particular government program or that they want some particular government program or that they're voting for George Bush or that they're voting for John Kerry or even for Ralph Nader is not necessarily a contradiction to the idea that government is too big because what they're saying is that they wish government were smaller, but since there's going to be some government, they would like part of that government to be the programs that they like and that they assume that they like. And so what is very, very helpful is to continue asking questions. You've asked the, qu the question, do you think government's too big, too small, or about the right size? And you got the answer, government's too big. So the next question is, what government programs do you think are too big or are un completely unnecessary? Where do you think government could be cut? And you may get the answer that I don't know that much about it, so I don't know. It just seems that government is way too big. All right, you can deal with that, but uh, it's not as easy to deal with that as it is if somebody says, well, for example, they do this, they do that, and so forth, and I think that's all worthless. And I think this war on drugs is a big joke. And so, you know, you get some answers from the person. You've already es establishing again within his own mind. He's beginning to identify the particular areas. And one thing you can build upon then is that, now that this person recognizes that there are various government programs that not, not only don't work, but that are probably doing a lot of harm, is to point out, well, you know, I'm glad you mentioned those because I agree with you. I think those programs are really very dangerous in ways. And if the person hasn't said that they're dangerous, but just that they're a joke, they don't work or whatever, you, you can say, you know, not only are they uh, ineffective, but they're really dangerous. Let me give you an example. And work with something that the person has already identified as a bad government program and then say, you know, since I've been looking into this, I find that the problems that exist in the drug war or whatever the specific program is that's been identified, that these things seem to exist across the board. For example, in healthcare, I have found, and you go into what you know about healthcare, if that's something you know something about, uh, and just pick one or two or three other programs depending on how much of his attention you have as to how much you can give him and without going too far. Now, let me digress for just a moment. It helps for your permanent effectiveness as a salesman of liberty to have a repertoire of two or three good government examples. And 
What you might do, I'm not here to plug my book, but my book, Liberty A to Z, has 800 and some one-liners, which are really one-paragraphers, concerning a whole host of government programs and principles and so forth. They're all sorted out by topic. In other words, just go through alphabetically. There's health care and there's education and all these things in alphabetical order. And pick some topics and pick up some of the ideas from there. Or maybe you don't need the book. Maybe you have them already. But have two or three programs that you can discuss intelligently. And it doesn't take too much learning to be able to get yourself in that position. What I was saying is have a repertoire of two or three programs to be able to then say the program you mentioned, whatever that may be, is a very, very good example of how government operates. But it isn't an isolated example. This kind of thing exists in almost any government program. Now, for instance, take, for example, government aid education and, and then go into the two or three ideas you have about government education, the two or three examples or principles uh, that can show that that's just as much of a boondoggle as whatever the program was that the person had showed uh, that he didn't approve of. And in doing this, you're building on what he knows, and you're helping him connect the dots, because that's the most important thing. Everybody knows something about government that he doesn't like, but everybody doesn't generalize on that and get the point that most government programs, if not all of them, probably operate the way that the program I don't like operates, that this is not an isolated example. And that's what our job is, is to connect the dots and show them that this is a general principle. And it helps then also to have some ideas about why this is a general principle. This doesn't just happen to be an inefficient organization that's being operated by the wrong people right now. This is the nature of government itself. And as I've said before on this show, some of the things to uh, think about yourself now while you're not talking to somebody else is the fact that government is force and ways that you can explain to people why this is destructive, that every government program involves force and why force never does produce the results intended for it, that uh, why it is that government doesn't work, why it is that power always expands far beyond whatever was granted to the politicians to begin with, why it is that government programs always turn out to be two, three, four, five times as, as big as they were proposed to be and so forth. And then the final clincher is even when somebody says that, well, I'm not, I don't want to give up my child's student loan or I don't want to give up my farm subsidy or whatever it is, and that is, would you give it up? Would you give up your favorite federal programs if it meant you never had to pay income tax again? Because if yeah. we just got rid of all these unconstitutional programs, there'd be no need for an income tax. And I'm not talking about replacing with a sales tax. There'd be no income tax at all. Your children would never pay income tax, and your grandchildren would grow up never even knowing that there was income tax. Oh, boy, that was a short segment. Uh, if, you're, if you want to stay on the phone through the news, Jonathan, we'll continue this, because I think we're talking about something very, very important here. Okay, yeah. So, Jonathan, what would you like to say to wind this uh, little conversation up? Yeah, I'll just say one uh, final thing so I don't take too, too much more of your time here, but uh, I think uh, what you said was it was a really good approach. I had already bought uh, your book, Liberty A to Z, and uh, I had uh, picked out some favorite uh, sound bites of mine, and uh, I use them whenever uh, appropriate now. So I think everything you said was uh, was really good. And uh, let, me, I, let me interrupt you before you go ahead to make your point then, uh, because it's very, very important to realize that you don't have to know everything. That's why I said pick two or three issues that you do know something about and just point out to these and say that as far as I can see, this is probably the way all of government works. Uh, even the areas and the programs I don't know about, I suspect that they're probably all the same as the one you pointed out and the one I just pointed out to you and so forth and so on. Uh, but don't feel you have to know everything. Pick two or three programs that you're very, very comfortable talking about. Maybe even one you have some personal experience with where you came up against the government in it. Uh, but I really want to emphasize that point that don't be overawed by this. Just, just find two or three and be satisfied with those because that's all you need. Go ahead, Jonathan. Sure. Um, I, I, and I think that's really good. Um, I think it's important to have a good approach. Uh, my original point was just uh, about um, was just regarding where people are now before the libertarian before we start doing these things or at this point in time. Mm -hmm. um, and my original point was basically just in my judgment, uh, vague polls that show that most Americans say yes when asked if government is too big aren't very significant in my view. Uh, just because someone says yes to that, it doesn't mean that he or she, uh, any of those people polled, support specific reductions in education or health care or crime control already before you talk to them. And I think that we libertarians, we delude ourselves when we think that uh, almost everybody in America, except for politicians and, you know, uh, bureaucrats or whoever, already agrees with our libertarian ideas uh, just because 60 or 70 percent of people say that they think in – if they answer yes when someone calls them on the telephone and says, do you think government's too big? Um, well, I think we're, but we're both saying the same thing here. The people think that government is too big, but they don't have specific programs in mind to reduce. That's why you ask them, you, uh, what programs do you think are too big that could be reduced? And then they stop and think about it, and they think, well, you know, I imagine you could probably get rid of this or that or something else, and, and just ask them to think about it. There, there's been no reason to think about it before. They haven't had any point in trying to sit down and think about this. They're not as concerned about it as you are, so by definition, they don't... Uh, 
bother trying to identify the programs, and that's your job, is through asking questions, is to get them to think about it. And another thing is that even if somebody says government is too small, that person is probably not a prospect, but you could ask them, do you think that all government programs work then? And the person will say, no, of course, uh, not all government programs work. Uh, well, what would be an example of a government program that isn't working very well? And, again, you get the person to identify some of these things that he has never thought about before. That's what you're there for. Um, and, again, I want to emphasize that just because somebody is voting for George Bush or John Kerry or just because he likes this program or that program does not mean that he's not a prospect because he has no way, of, he not only has no way, but he has no incentive to really think about these things and to change his course of behavior, and that's what you're there for. That's that's why we have work to do. If we didn't have any work to do, God, I'd be out of a job. So, anyway, thanks, Jonathan. I appreciate your call. Thank you. And call any time. Let's go now to Kansas and see what's on Jim's mind. Good evening, Jim. Yes, sir. Uh, I think we got to get a little more basic. You're right in what you're saying. Everything I've heard you say is right on the target. But uh, I'm a trucker, mm-hmm. and I dropped a little in upstate New York, asked for a restroom. They said, go down the hall, and you'll see a sign on the door. So I went down this long hall. And sure, there was signs on every door, neatly painted, except for one. There was one with a piece of cardboard and a string hanging on there. <laughs> well, I looked at it, and it said, Department of Human Resources. Bangle, red lights, <laughs> flags, you know. I, so I picked the sign up and looked underneath it, and sure enough, it said personnel. Now, I, I began to think about it. Well, what is a person versus a resource? Right. Uh-huh, quite a difference. <laughs> yes, I know. Uh-huh. It's no longer we the people, it's we the resources. Right. We're, the, we're, there, we're there to be used. Now, I, I got to think, well, who did this to us? So I went on the web when I got the first chance. And by the way, I checked this clear across the country. Every place I stopped, every place I dropped, every place I picked up, I always asked them, do you have a personnel department? Well, we used to, but we have now got a human resource department. Well, that's interesting. Anyway, so I saw I looked up in, for a law saying this. I could not find one. I'm pretty good at looking at laws. And I could not find anything that had to do with this whatsoever. Okay? Mm-hmm. So then I went to uh, uh, the corporations in England, Canada, uh, Australia, because they were English-speaking. And every one of them had also converted from personnel to human resources. And then, as I was driving down the road, I began to see that the State Departments of, uh, of Employment were no longer the State Departments of Employment. They were the State Departments of Human Resources. And then I got in contact with the Army. And they no longer had a personnel department. They have a Department of Human Resources. Now, Cannon fodder. Go ahead. Somebody in this world has enough power to convert at least four countries simultaneously, overnight, from, and c- convert all the people from a person to a thing. A resource, and they have the power to do anything they want to to their resources. Just like you would have if you have a bunch of cattle. Let's say you wouldn't let them have a gun if you didn't know how to use it. <laughs> well, we are their resource, and they do what they want to to us, and they do it totally out of law. They do it because they have the power, and that's the guys that really run this country. Whoever has the power to do that overnight and run all these countries and well, all these corporations. I agree completely with your thought. It, it actually isn't overnight. Uh, it was. Um I'm not sure when. I think it was during the Nixon administration that they changed the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare into the Department of Health and Human Resources. I, if oh, I have, went back that far. Yeah, if I have that straight. What, what's happened here is that government made the change first, and what you're reporting about what companies are doing is really new to me. I know that some companies have called their personnel department the Human Resources, but I didn't know it was so universal. And we're talking with Jim in Kansas, who's a trucker, and he's been driving around the country and noticing that everywhere that there used to be a personnel sign on the door at some company, it now says something to the effect of Department of Human Resources, meaning that we've all become resources rather than people. And, Jim, I was saying that the federal government renamed the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare to the Department of Health and Human Resources back sometime. I'm not really sure when, but I I suspect it was during the Nixon administration about 30 years ago. And I think one after another, state governments changed it. I I noticed that driving around, I would pass the unemployment office and see that it was now the Department of Human Resources, and I have that same reaction that you've had. But the fact that you're seeing corporations do this uh, and companies one after another after another, since they don't have to and they shouldn't be thinking in those terms, it strikes me that this must be some kind of government regulation that's come up that requires them to refer to that, and I don't know why there would be such a regulation unless... That's what I thought, and I could not find one. Yeah, it just it doesn't make any sense because uh, ah. companies companies don't want their employees to think of themselves as resources uh, because, that, because that's going to make them mad at the company, you know. Harry, it does make sense. Well, go ahead. Because if well, you look at the money system, you take a dollar bill, a twenty dollar bill, doesn't matter, it needs to pay for money, and it, on the top it says Federal Reserve Note, right? Mm-hmm. L-T-E. Then it says down below, this note. Two places it calls it a note. So you look up a note in Black's Law and you find out that the note is a promissory note. Yes. It's a promise to pay. But it requires four things. Somebody has to pay somebody else by a certain due date a certain amount. And you look at our order money like the silver certificate. 
And it says very clearly, a uh, silver certificate across the top, doesn't say anything about a note. But then it says, this certifies that there's on deposit in the Treasury of the United States of America, one dollar in silver. There's a guy that's going to pay. Right? Mm-hmm. Yes. Then it says, payable to the bearer. There's a guy that's going to be paid. Then it says, on demand. There's a due date. And then, of course, the, the amount is on the course. Now, that was a true note. And if you took that note to a bank when it was legal money, and the banker and said, Mr. Banker, you made me a note for a dollar. Give me something of real value for this piece of paper. And the guy gave you a silver dollar. Or ten quarters, or ten times, rather. But how does this relate to the resources? Okay, I'm getting to that. Okay. Because if our present note is not a note, look it up in blacks. What is the Federal Reserve note if it is not a note? It is a similar... Is that ring of uh, color of law? A legal lie? It is a similarity to the real note, is basically what Black's Law says. So then what is the real note? Well, the real note is the person who signs the note when he borrows the money and therefore creates our money. And without us to sign the notes and pledge our future labor, there would be no money. If you don't buy, borrow to buy that car... You don't create any money. If you don't create any money, how are you going to sell a car? Well, uh, I think the reason it's called a note is because that's what it was before, and they just pulled the, the bottom out from under it and left the appearance to be the same on the top. No. When they do something legal, Harry, they do it by the words. I mean, the words is their Bible. But I, I don't see this as, as bearing directly on the question of people as resources. I think no. that, that they're both examples of government uh, just simply encroaching further and further and taking away more and more from in, uh, the individual. Uh, I think that it's just another front in the war between government and the people. But I don't see as one being the cause or the other. It's more that they're both moving along parallel lines. But Harry, if, if you were going to create a money system, what would you use as the source of value? Well, first of all, I wouldn't create a money system because money has to come out of the natural marketplace from the people. Nobody ever said, we now decree that gold is money, except after the marketplace had decreed that gold was money. And decree is a bad word with regard to the marketplace. It just evolved but that people silver, found it was the, the best form of money. The silver certificate decreed that. And well, the gold certificate decreed it was gold was money. Well, in, yes, but uh, no, it didn't decree that either was money. People chose to use gold and silver as money, and the government, because people had chosen it, said that we okay. will issue... Uh, in fact, the government didn't even issue anything to begin with. Uh, it, it was just that banks issued money, and uh, they had gold on deposit to back it up. But over a period of time, the government encroached by setting up a program to try to aid miners. That's when they created the silver certificates. They said any miner could bring his silver to the Treasury and get a dollar twenty for it, and therefore, well, no, pardon me, it was 91 cents originally, but anyway, uh, and this way, the government issued these silver certificates as receipts for the silver, and the silver certificates uh, circulated its money, and then the $20 uh, uh, gold pieces and so forth that the government admitted, but it said specifically in the Constitution that only gold and silver could be uh, used as money by the government, but people were still free to do whatever they wanted, but then eventually legal tender laws were passed that said you had to use the government's choice of money and so on, so it's, again, what we have here is a situation where the government takes over something, and then everybody believes that it must have been the government that created it to begin with, which is not the case. I don't think it's the government at all. It's the Federal Reserve System. Well, the Federal Reserve System, we're not going to get into that again tonight, no. but the Federal Reserve System is a part of the government. It, oh, was, yeah. it was masquerading as a private agency merely to circumvent the constitutional, uh, the lack of authority in the Constitution for there to be a national bank. But the Federal Reserve is in every sense a national bank. And uh, so anyway, but I, I appreciate you bringing to our attention the resources thing. It is a... Uh, but don't forget, though, that no money is ever created until somebody signs a note, be it an individual, corporation, or the government. Somebody has to sign a note. And to sign a note, you must pledge something. Something of real value. Well, and the pledge on the note when you buy a car is your future labor. But there is no real value behind the, the $20 federal Oh, yes, reserve. there is. And the what? real value is the pledge of labor. If I could get everybody in America to pledge all their labor to me, I'd be filthy rich. Well, it isn't pledged at the moment. That doesn't mean that it might not be in the future by a decree of the government. But at the moment, uh, no one has pledged his labor, and there is no law requiring people to go to work. But uh, it, that's not to say that if we continue on this road that that won't be the case someday. Jim, thanks so much for your call, and um, keep on trucking. Well, let's go to Massachusetts and talk with Matthew. Good evening, Matthew. Hello, Mr. Brown. How are you doing? Just fine. What's up? Oh, just uh, Hitler did invade, invade Germany. Just, uh... <laughs> That's true. He was an Austrian, after all. Yeah, um, and I missed you last weekend. Yeah. We, we, we turned it on, and we heard, Geez, this is an old show. <laughs> kind of ruined the whole evening. I just didn't know what to do with ourselves after that. Oh, my God. Get a life. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, uh, I was just uh, wanted to make two points. One was about the topic you were discussing with Jonathan Washington, D.C. on, was um, my, how I communicate liberty with people is um, having a conversation where uh, they're discussing with me about something, and it comes to a kind of a natural point where they discuss, where they bring up a subject where the government is involved, and, you know, 99% of the time in a negative way with their lives, 
and I like to just kind of pinpoint that and go from there. Kind of like find that one point where that's their personal issue mm -hmm. and go with that and kind of, kind of run with that and just kind of let them kind of talk themselves into a libertarian position on, on, on a topic. Right. That it, uh, it, that it works almost 90% of the time, you know, and I kind of like let it go from there. I, it, to me, it's letting someone talk do the talking and just kind of guiding them toward a liberty, a liber, you know, a liberty position. Right. Well, the, the asking the question of where do you think government is too big, what what programs uh, do you not like about the government, is a way of getting them to focus on that hot button. Exactly. And uh, so, you know, you don't necessarily have to wait uh, if you're talking about uh, the World Series and this and that and so forth, and the other person brings it around to something he doesn't like about government, that's fine. But at the same time, if it doesn't look like it's going to head that way, you know, I heard an interesting question the other night on the radio. The guy, whatever his name was, was asking the question, do you think government is too big, too small? about the right size and I, th I thought to myself that's an interesting question how would you answer that yeah. and and then go on from there when they say whether whether they say it's too big or too small well, that's interesting uh, are there any government if, if it's too small are there any government programs you don't like or if, it, if uh, it's too big then uh, well give me an example of a government program you think is a big waste or, or something that you think is an intrusion or whatever and uh, as you say let them talk about it yeah. and then it's our job to generalize on that right. to, to try to expand that into other government programs and to show that what they are upset about is not a unique situation and then of course at some point if, if you can then try to point out what this would mean to the other person if you got rid of it because people complain about a government program that, but they don't really take it personally they just think it's stupid it's right. d dangerous this or the other thing but when you can say my god you know if we could get rid of that then this is what it would mean to your child's schooling or this is how much better health care uh, for you and your family would be or this is how much money uh, you'd be able to save if we could return that money to, to you and me and everybody else and so forth right. so it, whenever you can bring it back to the personal level then you're really hitting home I believe well, if you, if you hear any screams right now, it's no one's being tortured, just uh, Keely's watching the, the big game tonight, World Series, so oh. uh, uh, don't, don't freak out or anything. But, uh, <laughs> what's, what's, the, what's the score so far? <laughs> I think it's 9 7 us. So, you know, uh, Who, who's winning? It must be St. Louis. Uh, <laughs> if, if somebody in Boston is screaming, St. Louis must be winning. Right. Uh, okay. But the other point I was, gonna, um, I was wanting to talk about was that I've just been noticing that I read these, um, I pick up this libertarian book, and I, I, I believe it, it was by a guy named James Walsh. I'm probably getting his name wrong, but. You know, and well, I'm like, this is great. It's a libertarian book. And what's the name of what's the name of the book? Maybe I know the author. Um, uh, roughly, what's the name of the book? That's, I, I'm blanking. I'm completely okay. blank. I'm. Uh, I, uh, I can't. Okay, well, I focus, focus. well, that's all right. Go, go ahead. My, with, my point yeah. being was that um, I, like, I, it, I just noticed this problem where sometimes I, there seems to be a certain segment of of libertarianism that is kind of our own worst enemy in a lot of ways, where mm -hmm. it seems like people. You know, I, I read these, this, like I read this book where I get up to the Libertarian Party and suddenly this, uh, suddenly he's just, uh, focusing on these two, like, problem issues like Howard, uh, uh, uh Howard Stern and, uh, a couple, like some, a couple of other whack jobs. And I think we scored. And, um, and, and <laughs> it, yes, and so it, really. It suddenly it invalidates all this work that the vast majority of people have been doing. And it, well, it, it, again, he's not generalizing on it. He's he's saying the government is doing a terrible job in this area and, and, and some other area and so on, but does not generalize from it. And so he doesn't see himself as part of a libertarian movement to reduce government across the board. What he wants to do is just uh, get government to quit, quit interfering with his pet project. Well, no, this is a person who consider people who are libertarian. They call, oh, call themselves libertarian. They, they consider themselves libertarian. This person was a this book is about is about libertarian thinking and stuff. But I see. when it comes down, lately, for instance, John Stossel in his book. Um, give me a break, which is a wonderful book, but he also, he's very he's very down on the Libertarian Party. I see. And it, I've, it's, it's like it seems to me it's like uh, the, the music means we've got to take a break. Uh, hang on, this is Harry Brown. We'll be back in just a couple of minutes. We're talking now with Matthew in Massachusetts. And what were you going to say about John Stossel's approach? Oh, I was I was going to say he's uh, I mean he's a, he's a fabulous vocal uh, Libertarian who. He's uh, doing a lot of great job. I don't know if you've seen his uh, specials. Yes, yes, yeah. I think he does a good job. Yeah, he really does. And uh, but I mean, it seems like you have these outspoken, some of these outspoken libertarians who you know have these books and things like that, and then but they have this very negative uh, attitude towards the Libertarian Party. And I think that that it's kind of like with a with friends like this, 
need enemies kind of. Well, as far as the party is concerned, definitely, uh, I, I agree with you. Uh, I think a lot of these people just think that the party is irrelevant, that we've got to deal with what exists, and that's Bush and Kerry, and I don't want Kerry, or I don't want Bush, or, or whatever. And then you also just have a certain competitive, competitiveness that exists in the libertarian movement, as you would in any movement, uh, just as we've seen within the libertarian party, that competitiveness can get, right. get to be destructive after a while. And uh, so I can't ascribe motives to any particular individual, because I have no idea oh, no, uh, how they arrive at their decisions. Mm -hmm. uh, and I really realize you're not doing that either. You just wish it were otherwise, and, right. and I do too. Not that I can expect everyone to be, everyone be friend, that kind of thing, but it just seems like there's some people out there who could, do I wish I could, I could personally persuade them to uh, uh, either kind of, kind of uh, get a better view of the Libertarian Party and speak out more mm -hmm. on it in some way, shape, or form, than sure. to kind of like send a, a paragraph just kind of disparaging the Libertarian Party and all these thousands of people that are trying, are working very hard, and then just kind of uh, denying all this, this it seems like it works against us, you know. Sure, and, no, I, uh, I understand. Yeah, that's my only. That's just something I just because uh, I, I just read something recently. That's what I just wanted to comment on that. And, okay, uh, but I just thanks. To, you know, you do a great job, and uh, I'm going to buy your book, your new book, and uh, take a look at it along with um, uh, Mr. Cloud's new book. And, yes. Uh, which is not a great, looks like that's a great thing to take a look at. Yes, I think it is too. Yeah. And I'll, uh, I'll put, I have Liberty A to Z up on the website. Uh, go to rate, go to the radio links page, which is linked right at the top of the home page. And there's Liberty A to Z by Harry Brown. And I will, at the next break, put Michael Cloud's link up there also because he's written a good book on libertarian persuasion. Matthew, thanks for your call. Yeah. And let's, uh, go ahead now to Arizona and talk with Dave. Good evening, Dave. Hi, Harry. How are you? Just fine. What's up? Well, it's great to talk with you. I've been reading a lot of stuff that you write for quite a while. And I especially enjoy what you write about war. But I want to talk tonight about airline travel. When I first saw your note about airline travel, I didn't read it uh, until I had a similar experience, and I came back and read it, and I, I personally share your anger to a great degree. Um, what happened was we changed our flight reservations uh, the night before we were going to leave. Oh, and that's a short tip off. That's right. Yeah. And so we were, we were uh, singled out for a special search. And uh, I want to tell you, I'm, I'm 55 years old. Uh, I'm quite visually impaired. Uh, I don't think I look like a terrorist in any way. And I was personally offended when they pulled me aside and, and proceeded to grope me down looking for, um, for I don't know what. It's humiliating. It, it really is. If in any other context uh, you see this being done, you would say, why are you humiliating these people? Absolutely. But, you know, and, and what, the worst part of it, though, is what occurred to me was, now, if they want to think I'm a terrorist, or this is how they would treat a terrorist, then what good is the other search? Yes, you know, right. They, they I, I asked, that's exactly what I asked the, the guy that was patting me down. Why aren't you doing this to everybody if this was so necessary? Well, I don't know. I didn't make the rules. Well, I, you know, and I, I think it's and the reason I called is I think we have to ask those questions. Yes. And, and I simply said to him, do, you, do I really look like a terrorist? And he said, no. And, and I think we have to try to get them to think through what they're doing as individuals. Yes. I hear your music, and I want to thank you for the opportunity to be on here. Eric. Oh, thank you, Dave. I appreciate your call. And call any time. Uh, but I hope it's not that you've been on the airlines again. We'll be right back, folks. Stay tuned. I wish I had time to cover all the emails that have come in the last couple of hours, but let me just take a few. Jerry calls my attention to the fact that it is not the Department of Health and Human Resources. It's the Department of Health and Human Services. He's absolutely right. So it's at the state level that they've renamed all the labor and employment offices as human resources. Uh, Matt asks, when you ran for president in 2000, you were able to get on a, a very large number of television shows for an interview. Why do you suppose that Badnarik is having a virtual media blackout? Is it because of campaign management or because of a real conspiracy against libertarians? I don't know. I am not privy to what's going on inside the campaign. I do know that we worked very hard to get those, and I, uh, we had people not just receiving inquiries from the media, but actually contacting the media to set up interviews in places where we wanted to have interviews. Plus, we found that we were very welcome on these shows, that they liked the idea of having a third party person come on and give a different viewpoint because it made the show different it gave them an opportunity to present something different from the same old this side or that side that was so prevalent on the television shows they like to be able to present variety so libertarians should be welcome and robert writes and says i live in a state as they call it state in play meaning one where the two major parties are fighting for that state, that it's a close race in that state, and so the parties are relentlessly bombarding the airways with advertising. And so too many people are saying, well, I normally have no problem with third parties. This election is too important and far too close to vote for a third-party candidate. So what kind of a principal comeback can I make to this? Well, the first thing I would say is, you know, that's exactly what they said in 2000, and in fact that's exactly what they said in 96 and 92. Every election is the most critical election we've ever had in this country. But nobody explains why it's critical. Why would we expect there to be any difference whether Bush is elected or Kerry is elected. And there probably are more answers, but uh, music means we're running out of time, so let me leave you with one last 
a uh, message from uh, a day, another Dave out there in cyberspace. Ralph Waldo Emerson said, do not go where the path may lead. Go instead where there is no path, and you leave a trail. Think about that. And also, think about the fact that you ought to do something nice this week for yourself and your family, because the first and most important thing is to enjoy life. So please do enjoy life, and please come back next Saturday night. This is Harry Brown. Thanks for listening. <laughs>